I'm delighted to have Thomas Hayes join our family. He has not been one of the regulars, but we're hoping he will be. He's going to chat a little bit about something that's near and dear to my heart because John Templeton was one of my uh, dearest friends when he passed, uh, but he opened my eyes to the emerging market world through Mark Rubius, who many of you know and we also work with. But this gentleman is going to talk about why emerging market equities will outperform developed markets over the next 12 to 36 months. I like that. Thomas J. Hayes is the founder and chairman and managing member of Great Hill Capital, a long short equity manager based in New York City. Before starting his own firm, Mr. Hayes worked with Cornwall Capital, one of the firms featured in the big short book and movie. He publishes his timely stock market commentary, hedge fund tips with Tom Hayes, video casts and podcasts, on a weekly basis. He has a wide following in the investment management, hedge fund, and media community. Please give a warm welcome to Thomas Hayes. Okay. So, uh, everyone's been sitting for a little while. Uh, let's get a little energy going while we stand up for a quick second. And I find these events are really valuable, mostly for networking as well. So I'd encourage you, turn to the person to the left or the right, say your name, hi, I'm Tom, I'm from Connecticut, and what you do. And while we're doing that, how many of you, is this your first Money Show conference? How many of you have been coming for multiple years, more than three years? Yeah, I met some people last night who've been coming to this show for 10 years, 20 years. This is legendary. So I want to thank Kim, I want to thank Aaron, I want to thank Mike, I want to thank Debbie and the entire crew for putting on such an incredible conference and inviting me to speak here. So let's give them a hand. So we're going to talk about emerging markets. Hands up. Who has exposure to emerging markets right now? Okay. Hands up, who after seeing the China trade data this morning is excited about China? Crickets. Okay. <laughs> I couldn't have picked a better day to do this presentation, but I think by the end of this presentation, you're going to find that there may be some opportunity. It's just looking past kind of the windshield and looking to the future 12 to 36 months out and the opportunities that are there. So we're going to talk a little bit about history to get some inkling as to what might happen moving forward. Uh, this is opinion, not advice, all the natural disclaimers. So let's see.
is ranked number one by Feed Spot in the hedge fund category, and that's free for you to benefit wherever you get your podcasts or also on YouTube. We view our confidence in this location uh, when others are bailing is rooted in deep research and the premise that the more price becomes dislocated, uh, the more risk that has actually come out. Who feels like when, when a stock or a market or a sector falls pretty dramatically, oh, that's extremely risky? Everyone feels that way sometimes when the, you know, a stock down 50%. Oh, that one's got a lot of risk. But the ones that are going up or have already gone up tenfold or, or 15-fold, everyone says, well, there's no risk there because it just keeps going up and saves. That's, that's where I'll put my money. And that's kind of the uh, real opportunity in markets over time. If you can look past the short-term volatility and take advantage of these opportunities, that's where you can make big money over time. Now, you're going to hear a little bit about where I cut my teeth, and it's going to start to make more sense why I think in this way uh, when it's uh, not very common. So I have one and a half decades in the hedge fund industry, predominantly long, short, and multi-strap funds. Um, you heard from Kim, I have great co capital. Uh, and who saw the, the big short movie? Okay. So I work for Ben Hockett. He's called Ben Rickett in the movie. Uh, he's less handsome in person than Brad Pitt, the, the actor who played his part. Uh, but he's probably a lot smarter, one of the smartest people in the business. Uh, and they were focused on esoteric derivative strategies with a value tilt, and uh, we have a tremendous uh, uh, relationship together, and we still talk uh, pretty regularly. So, uh, And then in the fund before that, uh, not only was I assigned to generate ideas for the portfolio of public securities, but one of the portfolio companies uh, in our portfolio was kind of struggling, and the head of the fund said, I'm putting you in as chief operating officer of the public company, I want you to go in, sell off all of the non-core assets, take the cash, and buy an asset manager. And I was like, okay boss, you know, I'll, I'll go ahead and do that. Uh, public company COO, I can hardly tie my shoes at the time. Uh, but what was interesting about this exercise was, over the next 12 months, I interviewed over 100 different asset managers. Institutional managers, financial advisors, RIAs, uh, some, some household names. Uh, and what I was able to do is look under the cover and find out which businesses were durable over five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20, which stood the test of time, which strategies were pop and drop and they didn't really last, which companies continued to compound and build, build their clients' capital. And what I came to the conclusion of was that there was always some underlying value mindset in the companies that did well over the long term. And the growth companies were more volatile and, and less reliable in terms of predicting their cash flow in terms of the business. And that should tell you something as an investor that there is opportunity and value, not just cheap for cheap sake, but cheap when you have an embed of quality in the business. And we're going to talk a, about one example here. Um, so that first fund that I was with was seeded by three gentlemen you may know. Mike Bloomberg put up $25 million. Sam Bell put up 25 million, Sandy Weil of Citigroup put up 25 million. So I cut my teeth, and the founder was very good friends with Warren Buffett for 40 years. So I cut my teeth around these guys, going to idea dinners with Lee Cooperman and Mary Rivelli, and going out to meetings, Berkshire at every meeting. And you know Buffett's philosophy, be, be greedy when others are fearful, be fearful when others are greedy, and right now, would you say people are greedy about emerging markets in China or fearful about emerging markets in China? Do you think that will stay that way forever? This time is different, it's never going to come back? Or do you think that it may come back and there may be some problems for that to happen? Aladdin. Okay, good. So we're on the same page. So this is emerging markets. This is a long-term ch uh, chart of emerging markets. And what you can see, going back to the 90s, there was a long-term period, multi-year period, of sideways consolidation, okay? No one wanted emerging markets. Why would you be in emerging markets when you could be in dot-com and you could buy eyeballs instead of businesses that actually generated cash? But that changed, and then what you saw immediately following that from 2002 to 2007, about 450% rally in the indices. Uh, and the indices 
seats are, are valuable, but what's more valuable is when you have a move like that, you have companies and stocks that are going up many multiples of that. So the indices are up 20%, you can have companies that are going up 50%, 100%, and a lot more. And the same thing is true with emerging markets. And what we see right now is emerging markets have basically done nothing in 15 years. Okay, they've been grinding sideways, they've been consolidating sideways after a 450% move. There's been no opportunity. If you look at that peak in 2007, it's very, very close to where we are right now. And we think the stage is being set for a similar move to 2002 to 2007. And we're going to talk a little bit about why. Um, the thing about that is, when something's been consolidating for 15 years, we're not going to be able to tell you which day or week it's going to turn and permanently go straight up. But if you set your sails, you can be carried away as the wind picks up and as the, as the rally comes through. Um, we do think that there are a couple of key factors that you have to keep in mind to take advantage of this. Number one, the most important thing is the US dollar. And the US dollar is critically a function of the Fed policy. And it's not just the absolute Fed policy, it's the relative Fed policy. So it is our view that the Fed is done or near done. Okay, maybe they have one more hike, maybe they have two more hikes. Our bet is they have zero more hikes, but it, it's really immaterial if they have zero or one. The, the key thing is, just as we started with foremost central banks in the tightening process, we are going to be finishing the foremost central banks uh, uh, with, with our tightening policy. And what that means is on a relative basis, emerging markets and non-US currencies are gonna be going up relative to the US dollar. And when that happens, emerging markets tend to flourish. When, when, the, when the dollar's been going up and it stops going up, it sets the stage for massive rallies in emerging markets. So, the first thing I want to point you to as we look through here, the red lines there is the emerging market chart, just like we showed. The black line in the background is the US dollar. And then we're going to talk about two simple indicators on the top. Who has ever heard of the most complex, sophisticated indicator called RSI or relative strength. Okay, is there anyone that that's new to today? No, okay, so let me just share my experience from being in this business for a long time. The more you zoom out with these indicators, the more valuable they become, okay? So if you're doing it on a one minute, you're gonna get chopped up on it until the cows come home. If you're doing it on a 15 minute, good luck. If you're doing it on a daily, maybe you start to have some slight edge, okay? But everyone's looking at the same indicators. What no one's doing, and I was telling this friend today, I'm in the time arbitrage business. If I buy quality enough, it's on sale, I'm just playing the waiting game until that intrinsic value is realized. Now, with these indicators, you got the RSI, you got the MACD. What this is showing is that there's only been five times that the RSI has been this low, it's gotten below the 30 level on a monthly chart, since the mid-90s, okay? We just hit one last fall. Remember when everyone was super pessimistic and Alibaba hit $58 and emerging markets was in the toilet, you can see it on the chart. That was one of those times. So it's starting to come off the boil. The second one is the moving average convergence divergence. After the RSI hit this extreme level of 30, and you saw the red line cross the black line, that's what we call a crossover, it confirmed that probably more likely than not, the worst of the scenario was already in the rearview mirror, meaning the lows in the emerging market index were probably in the rearview mirror. Is it perfect? No. Did it work four out of the last four times? Yes. Okay, but it's a small enough sample size that we can say, well, maybe this time's different, you know, Xi Jinping and yada yada yada. Uh, but we're, we're of the view that the most important factor besides those indicators as they relate to the emerging markets is the US dollar. And in all of these instances, you can see the common denominator with the vertical blue line was that the black line started to roll over. You can see that dollar straight, and then it rolled over, and then you got a 131% rally in emerging markets in the late 90s. Then, if you look at the early 2000s, you can see that the dollar peaked all the way at the top of the chart, that black line. That was the absolute bottom in emerging markets before you had the 450% rally over the next few years. Then you had 2009, 2007, 
you can see that black spike in the dollar was the bottom of emerging markets. Dollar rolled over, and then emerging markets rallied. We had it again in 2016. Dollar peaked through black, starting to roll over. Emerging markets had a 91% rally. And the exact same thing happened last October. The dollar peaked. How many of you recognize that? You saw the dollar peak in October. It's been weakening ever since. And we've since had a rally in emerging markets ever since. So pretty high correlation and pretty solid stuff. So we're going to move along here. This was our tell. If you go back to our podcast, Enter and Pitch with Tom Hayes, bring up the October sessions when everyone was pessimistic. We were talking about the US dollar. And we were using the commercial uh, commitments of traders, which is the Friday report for the CFTC. It showed the green line. We're selling ahead of commercials are always early and they're always right. The red line is kind of the hedge funds who think they're the smart money, but are often on the wrong side of the trade at extremes because they're trend followers. That showed us that the dollar was going to start to roll over, and we, we believe that trend is just beginning, which is going to help emerging markets. Uh, key thing here, demographics is destiny. As we know in the US, we've got millennials are now bigger than the, baby, than the baby boomers. The baby boomers 30 years ago were about the same age. That was around 1990. We had a monster rally in the 1990s. There's no instance in 100 years we can find in any country where when the largest part of the population is between 30 and 40, that the economy does and the stock market does make, do exceptionally well. That's what we have in the US. We are constructive, very constructive on the US for the next seven to 10 years. I think Tom Lee's gonna talk about it and someone else uh, spoke about it as well. This shows the long-term trend. You have 18 years of sideways consolidation, Great Depression, uh, 1970s, 2020s, and then you have uh, 17, 18 years of expansion, which implies based on age, housing formation, family formation, having babies, buying cars, buying cribs, buying sofas, that uh, we've got a lot more to go. And that could put us in the early 2030s at 14,000 on the S&P 500. Why does that matter? Because the similar demography uh, is in China. So China is the biggest way in emerging markets. We just went through that. You can see the top holdings, Alibaba, Tencent, Nitron, et cetera, 40% uh, of the emerging markets index. And China's population-based demography is now in that sweet spot, okay? So what people say about China's demographic problem is 100% true. In five years, they're gonna have a bad demographic problem just like Japan had in 1989. But you didn't wanna be short Japan in 1985 because they had the biggest rally in the shortest amount of time. The same, we believe we're gonna have one more parabolic move with China, which is the biggest weight in emerging markets. And that's predominantly dictated by the fact that uh, the larger part of the population is between 33 and 36. And usually those rallies uh, persist until they start to peak at age 40, when their spending goes down, when their housing formation goes down, when their family uh, formation goes down. And that's one of the reasons that we're bullish and overlaid it with the US to help me understand. Uh, one idea that we like in emerging markets, which is now our largest capital commitment, we have positions that have actually grown much larger in size because they're up 4x in the last uh, year or so. One is an auto supplier called Cooper Standard. Uh, but this is our largest capital commitment allocation in our portfolio, not Microsoft, you're gonna see in just a second. It's Alibaba, okay? Alibaba has the largest cloud share in China. They're spinning that company off, so they're gonna break the company into six parts to realize the value of the marketplace. Um, both the CEO and we believe that the cloud spinoff, AliCloud, is going to be worth more than the entire company is worth right now within the next two to three years. And we believe that because McKinsey has shown that the cloud business in China is going to triple uh, by 2025 and Alibaba having the largest share, 38%, is going to be a monster. AliCloud today is where Amazon Web Services was in the U.S. in 2016. And following that trajectory, they're going to do another $10 billion of operating income, which would be 60% higher than the entire Alibaba company was doing just a few years ago when the stock was trading at $300 and now trading at about $93 or $95. This reminds me very much of Microsoft from 2006 to 2013. In those seven years, remember Steve Ballmer, everyone says he was terrible, blah, blah, blah. Steve Ballmer was actually very good. In his tenure, from 2006 to 2013, he grew revenues by 112%. He grew cash flow by 193%, and he grew earnings by 
Guess how much the stock went up? Goose egg, zero. But he laid the foundations. You remember Warren Buffett, in the short term, the market is a voting machine based on emotions. In the long term, it's a weighing machine based on fundamentals. Over the next eight years, after he laid that foundation, the stock was up 1,500%. How many of you own Microsoft? How many of you bought it in 2013 after it had gone nowhere for seven years? How many of you wish you had bought it in 2013 because you had looked at the business and said, wow, they doubled the business, the stock has done nothing, this is intrinsic value, but I want to take advantage. And that's what happened. And by the way, for those of you who think, no, 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 Satya Nadella came in and changed the company. Well, over the next seven years, Satya basically performed the same as Bomber did in the previous seven years. He doubled the revenues, he doubled the cash flow, he doubled the earnings. But the difference is, over Bomber's tenure, the stock did zero. Over Satya's uh, tenure, the stock did 1,500% or 36% 36, 36 compound annual growth rate over those uh, seven or eight years. Alibaba is in the perfect setup. Here's the difference, ladies and gentlemen. Revenues are up over the last eight years, from 2014 IPO to the end of last year, revenues are up 884%. Cash flow per share is up 502%. Earnings per share is up 507%, and the share price has moved zero. Someone else has experienced all the pain, okay, of getting zero return while the intrinsic value of the business has, has multiplied. As that fund collapses, as flows move into emerging markets, Alibaba being one of the largest weights, in our view, both for fundamental, secular, and structural reasons, is going to be one of the biggest beneficiaries. The Politicians are all the same, whether they're communist or whether they're democratic. They all make the right decisions after they've exhausted all other possibilities, okay? So in the case of China, when you see the trade data numbers, when you see all this stuff, and you say, wow, this is bearish, this is bullish because Xi Jinping will have no choice in coming weeks but to unleash the bazooka of consumer-led stimulus. Alibaba is the tool taker for that stimulus, and that's why it's our largest capital, capital allocated position. And finally, uh, you can just see the multiples relative to history, the Hang Seng, when it gets down this low, if you buy it, you're ahead of those rallies. Uh, Alibaba's average multiple is 23 times, it's trading at 11 times forward. No one wants it when it's down, just like Microsoft in 2013. And that's it. So I want to thank everyone for uh, coming out today and listening, and I think we're going to take a couple of questions if needed. Uh, can you trust uh, the financials of a company like Alibaba? I, I mean, to me, I've been burned by the Chinese. They just lie on some of those financials. Yeah, I, I think that's a valid question. And that's why when we go into pockets of dislocation, like in 2020, when we were, when oil was trading negative, we weren't buying small EMP companies and hoping for the best. We bought Exxon when it was in the 30s. We bought Wells Fargo when it was trading at $25 a share. So during periods of dislocation, because you have that risk, you want to buy the highest quality. If there's a problem with Alibaba, the, the entire country is going to have a problem. But would I be buying small and mid-cap Chinese stocks? No, because it's a coin flip if you can count on it. Uh, Alibaba has gone through uh, all of the, uh, PCAOB has done all of the studies with regards to the auditors to keep them listed in the US. That was a big thing over the last year and a half, which was an overhang on the stock. That's been resolved now, so we're very confident in Alibaba. We're not confident in any random Chinese company or Chinese IPO. We'd be a little bit cautious, but very good point. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, Foxconn. I, I, it's a great question. I think it'll probably work. I haven't done enough work to have confidence uh, in that, but um, you know, it probably has an overhang right now because of the handset business, which will probably re-accelerate it because you have a lot of full forward folk. So generally, I'm probably sanguine, but I haven't done enough work to comment, and I think that's a great question to take. I'm going to check it out. Yes? Hundred percent. So here's the core difference. Um, like I said, oh, okay. The question is, what makes you think a dictator won't destroy the economy? Uh, the number one job of a politician is to get reelected. Okay. And what you saw in COVID is, do you remember the Chinese were locked down two years longer than everyone else, 
and they were actually like soldering people in their apartments so they couldn't leave if they had COVID. Uh, and then something changed overnight. And what changed overnight was you had a bunch of people rioting in the streets. And all of a sudden, Xi Jinping said, my power is at risk. If you want COVID, you can all have COVID. And literally within 24 hours, they opened the economy, there were no more restrictions, and miraculously COVID died in four weeks. Like, you know, you had a little restrictions, but it was just like, if you want COVID, you go have it, but I'm not gonna lose my power. The people have spoken, they're riding in the streets, he was afraid of the Tiananmen Square, and they opened right away. They've only been open for six months, they're getting their sea legs, and the next phase is you got 20% of youth unemployed in China. The last thing you want is, is educated, angry young people uh, that don't have jobs. And sooner or later, whether he proactively does the stimulus bazooka or reactively as we see, see a situation on the street again like we did with COVID, the bazooka is coming. The key is what is the catalyst? So he has dictator power, but it's limited by the fact of people's willingness to tolerate pain until they revolt, and then he has to make the change. And our bet is we're at that point now. Yes? Uh, what, what are your views on India at this point in time? I love India. We're going to take all the money we make in Alibaba and we're going to be buying India in three to five years. Here's why. If you look at the demography, and we're, we're constructed about India, period. It's gotten a little ahead of itself. But the demography of India is about five or ten years younger. The biggest portion of their population, about five or ten years younger. So I think it's a little early days in terms of really getting aggressive in India. There will be one-offs to do. But I think your thought process is 100% correct. We are watching it. We're looking at individual companies. We just think China is now, based on the age of their population, some of the, the catalysts that are in place. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? All right, well, thank you so much. I'm very grateful to have been here. Uh, please be careful. Mexico has been strong as a bull. I mean, uh, the offshore, uh, I, I think that their currency, along with many of the emerging currencies, are going to continue to appreciate against the dollar. I'm, I'm very constructive on, on Mexico. I think it's moved a lot. Uh, so we like to be in when no one wants it. And right now, people already want Mexico. People are seeing the opportunity in Mexico. So kind of run away from us a little bit. We want to get in on the ground floor before the takeoff. And I think Mexico has already taken off. And I think it's going to continue to flourish. But uh, great question. I like that. Yep. All right. Thank you.